The Innocents Abroad by Mark Twain Chapter 33 From Athens all through the islands of the Grecian archipelago, we saw little but forbidden sea walls and barren hills, sometimes surmounted by three or four graceful columns of some ancient temple, lonely and deserted, a fitting symbol of the desolation that has come upon all Greece in these latter ages. We saw no ploughed fields, very few villages, no trees or grass or vegetation of any kind, scarcely, and hardly ever an isolated house. Greece is a bleak, unsmiling desert, without our agriculture, manufactures, or commerce, apparently. What supports its poverty-stricken people or its government is a mystery. I suppose that ancient Greece and modern Greece compared furnish the most extravagant contrast to be found in history. George I., an infant of eighteen and a scraggy nest of foreign office holders, sit in the places of Themistocles, Pericles, and the illustrious scholars and generals of the golden age of Greece. The fleets that were the wonder of the world when the Parthenon was new are a beggarly handful of fishing smacks now and the men and the people that performed such miracles of valor at Marathon are only a tribe of unconsidered slaves today. The classic Ulysses has gone dry, and so have all the sources of Grecian wealth and greatness. The nation numbers only 800,000 souls, and there is poverty and misery and mendacity enough among them to furnish 40 millions and be liberal about it. Under King Otho, the revenues of the state were five millions of dollars, raised from a tax of one-tenth of all the agricultural products of the land, which tenth the farmer had to bring to the royal granaries on pack mules any distance not exceeding six leagues, and from extravagant taxes on trade and commerce. Out of that five millions, the small tyrant tried to keep an army of ten thousand men, pay all the hundreds of useless grand equerries in waiting, first grooms of the bedchamber, lord high chancellors of the exploded exchequer, and all the other absurdities which these puppet kingdoms indulge in, in imitation of the great monarchies. And in addition, he set about building a white marble palace to cost about five millions itself. The result was simply, ten into five goes no times and none over. All these things could not be done with five millions, and Otho fell into trouble. The Greek throne, with its unpromising adjuncts of a ragged population of ingenious rascals who were out of employment eight months in the year, because there was little for them to borrow and less to confiscate, and a waste of barren hills and weed-grown deserts, went begging for a good while. It was offered to one of Victoria's sons, and afterwards to various other younger sons of royalty who had no thrones and were out of business. But they all had the charity to decline the dreary honor and veneration enough for Greece's ancient greatness to refuse to mock her sorrowful rags and dirt with a tinsel throne in this day of her humiliation till they came to this young Danish George, and he took it. He has finished the splendid palace I saw in the radiant moon night the other night, and is doing many other things for the salvation of Greece, they say. We sail through the barren archipelago and into the narrow channel they sometimes call the Dardanelles and sometimes the Hellespont. 
This part of the country is rich in historic reminiscences and poor as Sahara and everything else. For instance, as we approached the Dardanelles, we coasted along the plains of Troy and passed the mouth of the Scamander. We saw where Troy had stood in the distance and where it does not stand now, a city that perished when the world was young. The poor Trojans are all dead now. They were born too late to see Noah's Ark and died too soon to see our menagerie. We saw where Agamemnon's fleets rendezvoused, and away inland a mountain which the map said was Mount Ida. Within the Hellas Pont we saw where the original first shoddy contract mentioned in history was carried out, and the parties of the second part gently rebuked by Xerxes. I speak of the famous bridge of boats which Xerxes ordered to be built over the narrowest part of the Hellespont, where it is only two or three miles wide. A moderate gale destroyed the flimsy structure, and the king, thinking that to publicly rebuke the contractors might have a good effect on the next set, called them out before the army and had them beheaded. In the next ten minutes he let a new contract for the bridge. It has been observed by ancient writers that the second bridge was a very good bridge. Xerxes crossed his host of five millions of men on it, and if it had not been purposely destroyed, it would probably have been there yet. If our government would rebuke some of our shoddy contractors occasionally, it might work much good. In the Hellespont we saw where Leander and Lord Byron swam across. The one to see her upon whom his soul's affections were fixed with a devotion that only death could impair, and the other merely for a flyer, as Jack says. We had two noted tombs near us, too. On one shore slept Ajax, and on the other Hecuba. We had water batteries and forts on both sides of the Hellespont, flying the crimson flag of Turkey, with its white crescent and occasionally a village and sometimes a train of camels. We had all these to look at till we entered the broad sea of Marmora, and then, the land soon fading from view, we resumed Euchre and Whist once more. We dropped anchor in the mouth of the Golden Horn at daylight in the morning. Only three or four of us were up to see the great Ottoman capital. The passengers do not turn out at unseasonable hours, as they used to, to get the earliest possible glimpse of strange foreign cities. They are well over that. If we were lying in sight of the pyramids of Egypt, they would not come on deck until after breakfast nowadays. The Golden Horn is a narrow arm of the sea which branches from the Bosporus, a sort of broad river which connects the Marmora and Black Seas, and curving around divides the city in the middle. Galata and Pera are on one side of the Bosporus and the Golden Horn. Stambul, ancient Byzantium, is upon the other. On the other bank of the Bosporus is Scutari and other suburbs of Constantinople. This great city contains a million inhabitants. But so narrow are its streets and so crowded together are its houses that it does not cover much more than half as much ground as New York City. Seen from the anchorage or from a mile or so up the Bosporus, is by, it is by far the handsomest city we have seen. Its dense array of houses swells upward from the water's edge and spreads over the domes of many hills. And the gardens that peep out here and there, the great globes of the mosques, and the countless minarets that meet the eye everywhere, invest the metropolis with the quaint oriental aspect one dreams of when he reads books of eastern travel. Constantinople makes a noble picture. 
but the attractiveness begins and ends with its picturesqueness. From the time one starts ashore till he gets back again, he execrates it. The boat he goes in is admirably miscalculated for the service it is built for. It is handsomely and neatly fitted up, but no man could handle it well in the turbulent currents that sweep down the Bosporus from the Black Sea. And few men could row it satisfactorily even in still water. It is a long, light canoe cake, large at one end and tapering to a knife blade at the other. They make that long, sharp end a bow, and you can imagine how these boiling currents spin it about. It has two oars, and sometimes four, and no rudder. You start to go to a given point, and you run in fifty different directions before you get there. First one oar is back in water, and then the other. It is seldom that both are going ahead at once. This kind of boating is calculated to drive an impatient man mad in a week. The boatmen are the awkwardest, the stupidest, and the most unscientific on earth, without question. Ashore it was, well, it was an eternal circus. People were thicker than bees in those narrow streets, and the men were dressed in all the outrageous, outlandish, idolatrous, extravagant, thunder and lightning costumes that ever a tailor with the delirium tremens and seven devils could conceive of. There was no freak in dress too crazy to be indulged in, no absurdity too absurd to be tolerated. No frenzy and ragged diabolism to, too fantastic to be attempted. No two men were dressed alike. It was a wild masquerade of all imaginable costumes. Every struggling throng in every street was a dissolving view of stunning contrasts. Some patriarchs wore awful turbans, but the grand mass of the infidel horde wore the fiery red skull cap they call a fez. All the remainder of the raiment they indulged in was utterly indescribable. The shops here are mere coops, mere boxes, bathrooms, closets, anything you please to call them, on the first floor. The Turks sit cross-legged in them, and work and trade and smoke long pipes and smell like, like Turks. That covers the ground. Crowding the narrow streets in front of them are beggars who beg forever yet never collect anything, and wonderful cripples distorted out of all semblance of humanity almost, vagabonds driving laden asses, Porters carrying dry goods boxes as large as cottages on their backs. Peddlers of grapes, hot corn, pumpkin seeds, and a hundred other things. Yelling like fiends. And sleeping happily, comfortably, serenely among the hurrying feet are the famed dogs of Constantinople. Drifting noiselessly about are squads of Turkish women. Draped from chin to feet in flowing robes, and with snowy veils bound about their heads that disclose only the eyes and a vague, shadowy notion of their features. Seen moving about far away in the dim, arched aisles of the great bazaar, they look as the shrouded dead must have looked when they walked forth from their graves amid the storms and thunders and earthquakes that burst upon Calvary that awful night of the crucifixion. A street in Constantinople is a picture which one ought to see once. Not oftener. And then there was a goose rancher, a fellow who drove a hundred geese before him about the city and tried to sell them. He had a pole ten feet long with a crook in the end of it, and occasionally a goose would branch out from the flock and make a lively break around the corner with wings half lifted and neck stretched to its utmost. Did the goose merchant get excited? No. 
He took his pole and reached after that goose with unspeakable sign Freud, took a hitch round his neck and yanked him back to his place in the flock without an effort. He steered his geese with that stick as easily as another man would steer a yawl. A few hours afterward, we saw him uh, sitting on a stone at a corner in the midst of the turmoil, sound asleep in the sun, with his geese squatting around him or dodging out of the way of asses and men. We came by again within the hour, and he was taking account of stock to see whether any of his flock had strayed or been stolen. The way he did it was unique. He put the end of a stick within six or eight inches of a stone wall, and made the geese march in single file between it and the wall. He counted them as they went by. There was no dodge in that arrangement. If you want dwarfs, I mean just a few dwarfs for a curiosity, go to Genoa. If you wish to buy them by the gross for retail, go to Milan. There are plenty of dwarfs all over Italy, but it did seem to me that in Milan the crop was luxuriant. If you would see a fair, average style of assorted cripples, go to Naples, or travel through the Roman states. But if you would see the very heart and home of cripples and human monsters, both go straight to Constantinople. A beggar in Naples who can show a foot which has all run into one horrible toe with one shapeless nail on it has a fortune. But such an exhibition as that would not provoke any notice in Constantinople. The man would starve. Who would pay any attention to attractions like his among the rare monsters that throng the bridges of the Golden Horn and display their deformities in the gutters of Stamboul? Oh, wretched impostor! How could he stand against the three-legged woman and the man with his eye and his cheek? How would he blush in presence of the man with fingers on his elbow? Where would he hide himself when the dwarf with seven fingers on each hand, no upper lip, and his underjaw gone, came down in his majesty? Bismillah! The cripples of Europe are a delusion and a fraud. The truly gifted flourish only in the byways of Pira and Stamboul. That three-legged woman lay on the bridge with her stock in trade so disposed as to command the most striking effect. One natural leg and two long, slender, twisted ones with feet on them like somebody else's forearm. Then there was a man further along who had no eyes and whose face was the color of a fly-blown beefsteak and wrinkled and twisted like a lava flow, and verily so tumbled and distorted were his features that no man could tell the wart that served him for a nose from his cheekbones. In Stamboul was a man with a prodigious head, an uncommonly long body, legs eight inches long and feet like snowshoes. He traveled on those feet and his hands, and was as sway-backed as if the Colossus of Rhodes had been riding him. Ah, beggar has to have exceedingly good points to make a living in Constantinople. A blue-faced man who had nothing to offer except that he had been blown up in a mine, would be regarded as a rank impostor, and a mere damaged soldier on crutches would never make a cent. It would pay him to get a piece of his head taken off, and cultivate a wen like a carpet sack. The Mosque of St. Sophia is the chief line of Constantinople. You must get a ferment and hurry there the first thing. We did that. We did not get a ferment, but we took along four or five francs apiece, which is much the same thing. I do not think much of the Mosque of St. Sophia. I suppose I lack appreciation. We will let it go at that. It is the rustiest old barn in heathendom. 
I believe all the interest that attaches to it comes from the fact that it was built for a Christian church and then turned into a mosque, without much alteration, by the Mohammedan conquerors of the land. They made me take off my boots and walk into the place in my stock and feet. I caught cold and got myself so stuck up with a complication of gum, slime, and general corruption that I wore out more than 2,000 pair of jack boots getting my boots off that night, and even then some Christian hide peeled off with them. I abate not a single boot jack. St. Sophia is a colossal church, 13 or 1400 years old, and unsightly enough to be very, very much older. Its immense dome is said to be more wonderful than St. Peter's, but its dirt is much more wonderful than its dome, though they never mention it. The church has 170 pillars in it, each a single piece, and all of costly marbles of various kinds but they came from ancient temples at Baalbek, Heliopolis, Athens, and Ephesus, and are battered, ugly, and repulsive. They were a thousand years old when this church was new, and then the contrast must have been ghastly. If Justinian's architects did not trim that many. The inside of the dome is figured all over with a monstrous inscription in Turkish characters wrought in gold mosaic, that looks as glaring as a circus bill. The pavements and the marble balustrades are all battered and dirty. The perspective is marred everywhere by a web of ropes that depend from the dizzy height of the dome and suspend countless dingy, coarse oil lamps and ostrich eggs six or seven feet above the floor. Squatting and sitting in groups here and there and far and near were ragged Turks reading books, hearing sermons, or receiving lessons, like children. And in fifty places were more of the same sort, bowing and straightening up, bowing again and getting down to kiss the earth, muttering prayers the while, and keeping up their gymnastics till they ought to have been tired if they were not. Everywhere was dirt and dust and dinginess and gloom. Everywhere were signs of a hoary antiquity, but with nothing touching or beautiful about it. Everywhere were those groups of fantastic pagans. Overhead the gaudy mosaics and the web of lamp ropes. Nowhere was there anything to win one's love or challenge his admiration. The people who go into ecstasies over St. Sophia must surely get them out of the guidebook, where every church is spoken of as being considered by good judges to be the most marvelous structure in many respects that the world has ever seen. Or else they are those old connoisseurs from the wilds of New Jersey who laboriously learn the difference between a fresco and a fire plug and from that day forward, feel privileged to void their critical bathos on painting, sculpture, and architecture forevermore. We visited the dancing dervishes. There were twenty-one of them. They wore a long, light-colored, loose robe that hung to their heels. Each in his turn went up to the priest. They were all within a large circular railing and bowed profoundly, and then went spinning away deliriously, and took his appointed place in the circle, and continued to spin. When all had spun themselves to their places, they were about five or six feet apart, and so situated the entire circle of spinning pagans spun itself three separate times around the room. It took twenty-five minutes to do it. They spun on the left foot and kept themselves going by passing the right rapidly before it and digging it against the wax floor. Some of them made incredible time. Most of them spun around 40 times in a minute, and one artist averaged about 61 times a minute and kept it up during the whole 25. His robe filled with air and stood out all around him like a balloon. 
They made no noise of any kind, and most of them tilted their heads back and closed their eyes and tranced with a sort of devotional ecstasy. There was a rude kind of music part of the time, but the musicians were not visible. None but spinners were allowed within the circle. A man had to either spin or stay outside. It was about as barbarous an exhibition as we have witnessed yet. Then sick persons came and lay down, and beside them women laid their sick children, one a babe at the breast. And the patriarch of the dervishes walked upon their bodies. He was supposed to cure their diseases by trampling upon their breasts or backs or standing on the back of their necks. This is well enough for people who think all their affairs are made or marred by viewless spirits of the air, by giants, gnomes, and genii, and who still believe to this day all the wild tales in the Arabian Nights. Even so, an intelligent missionary tells me. We visited the Thousand and One Columns. I do not know what it was originally intended for, but they said it was built for a reservoir. It is situated in the center of Constantinople. You go down a flight of stone steps in the middle of a barren place, and there you are. You are forty feet underground, and in the midst of a perfect wilderness of tall, slender, granite columns of Byzantine architecture. Stand where you would, or change your position as often as you pleased, you were always a center from which radiated a dozen long archways and colonnades that lost themselves in distance and the somber twilight of the place. The old dried-up reservoir is occupied by a few ghostly silk spinners now, and one of them showed me a cross cut high up in one of the pillars. I suppose he meant me to understand that the institution was there before the Turkish occupation, and I thought he made a remark to that effect. But he must have had an impediment in his speech, for I did not understand him. We took off our shoes and went into the marble mausoleum of the Sultan Mahmud, the neatest piece of architecture inside that I have seen lately. Mahmud's tomb was covered with a black velvet pall which was elaborately embroidered with silver. It stood within a fancy silver railing. At the sides and corners were silver candlesticks that would weigh more than a hundred pounds, and they supported candles as large as a man's leg. On the top of the sarcophagus was a fez with a handsome diamond ornament upon it, which an attendant said cost a hundred thousand pounds, and lied like a Turk when he said it. Mahmud's whole family were comfortably planted around him. We went to the great bazaar in Stamboul, of course, and I shall not describe it further than to say it is a monstrous hive of little shops, thousands, I should say, all under one roof, and cut up into innumerable little blocks by narrow streets which are arched overhead. One street is devoted to a particular kind of merchandise, another to another, and so on. When you wish to buy a pair of shoes, you have the swing of the whole street. You do not have to walk yourself down hunting stores in different localities. It is the same with silks, antiquities, shawls, etc. The place is crowded with people all the time, and as the gay-colored eastern fabrics are lavishly displayed before every shop, the great bazaar of Stamboul is one of the sights that are worth seeing. It is full of life and stir and business, dirt, beggars, asses, yelling peddlers, porters, dervishes, high-born Turkish female shoppers. Greeks, and weird-looking and weirdly dressed Mohammedans from the mountains and the far provinces, and the only solitary thing one does not smell when he is in the great bazaar is something which smells good.